Uh, so, I want you to understand brass, probably one of the most, um, uh, there are sureties that, that we know about brass that, that are just there and this is what we do. Uh, so when we go through these brass things, a lot, a lot is going to transfer from one instrument to another. But what I'd like to start with is just some common things that I see uh, with just hand position, uh, with, with just holding the equipment properly, and just some things to be mindful of. I know a lot of us in here are brass players, but sometimes it's just good to hear a reminder. And for those woodwind, uh, woodwind friends we have in the room, just a, good to know what to look for if you don't have a brass friend in the room with you. So starting with trumpet, one of the first things that I that I one of the first things that I've noticed, even in my own in my own group, is that we have collapsed hand positions which don't allow for dexterity further on down the line. So when you're talking about trumpet, you want to make sure that a couple of things are, are fundamentally there. So if you have a trumpet, you go with me here. And that, that second valve is going to be on the back side. That's going to be a nice point for you to tactile say, do you see the second valve? This is where your thumb should be on your right hand. Please don't try to go with the hitchhiker thumb this way or, or do something strange with that thumb. Just lock it in and then you're going to make a C. So what I see in the middle school room a lot of times is this. We get flat fingers. How many of you guys have seen the, the flat fingers on the buttons and the kids think they're doing a great job and they the most part are. But we want to set them up for success farther than just this first note that we're about to get to. So we want to make sure that we have the nice C position. Everybody show me your C position. So when you take this position and you place it on a, on a trumpet, it's just literally going to fit right where it's supposed to go. And those buttons are going to be there. A lot of times you see the, the pinky under the hook. I like to teach them not to use that hook. I, I know it's there, but I tell them we're not making bugle calls. We're not on horses. There's no need for us to try to hold on to our instrument and ride an animal at the same time. So you put your pinky on the top of that uh, on the top of that hook, so that all of our fingers are able to move. Because you know that these some of these are connected. So this pinky is going to need to be free. So you want to make sure that it is not inside of that hook. Everybody good on that? Yep. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, um, moving along, and then the the third valve slide. So a lot of times we just forget that it's there, uh, and we shan't to do that. That is something that we shall never, never do. We have to remember it's there. So with small hands, if they leave that in the position that it's in from the time they get it out of the case, more than likely they're not going to be able to, to maneuver that third valve slide. So it's our job to go in and personally adjust these things when you're talking about how you get the instrument out of the case and all, going through and adjusting it for each single person who plays a trumpet in your group so that they are able to move and adjust that third valve slide. So when you go to teach the low D, that you're not teaching them the improper way to play it, which is to not adjust anything at all. Everybody good? Yeah? All right. A uh, common problem that I see with, with French horn. Let's go to French horn. Um, we have a French horn over here. So a lot of times we the kids will get sneaky and sly and stop using correct hand position in the right hand. So you'll see the bell, and then you'll see a hand, boom, right there on top of the bell. Like, this is what I'm supposed to do. No, it is not, actually. So you have to go back and reinforce that hand position. What is that hand position? It's a good question. I like to teach them to cup a little bit of water in the middle in their hand. So take your right hand, left hand, whichever one, right hand would be preferable. And I want you to pretend like you poured a little bit of water in that hand, right? There's a little bit of water there. And now, we're going to keep this. I want you to dump it out. Right? And then you're going to find there's a brace on that, on that French horn. There's a brace that connects the rest of the horn to the bell, and you're going to stick your hand in the same alignment with that. And it's going to cup. It should be cupped, right? So you don't want to have, it, it shouldn't be all the way in the French horn. shouldn't be uh, pulled back until there's really nothing there. You're going to want to make sure, hey, it's a French horn. It magically appeared. Um, you're going to want to make sure that that hand has a cupped, position inside of that bell because it's going to start to do something for them a little bit later on. They're going to need to know that this hand can raise and lower pitch. They're going to need to be able to maneuver that. But if their hand is here, there's no way that they're going to be able to do that. If their hand is here, I've seen this a lot, the hand just rests on the inside of the bell. There's going to be no way for them to actually adjust any pitch if their hand position is not correct. So just get make sure that they're cupped, right? And, and it's not going to go past their knuckle. What if they're too small? What if my what if my my kid uh, is really is a tiny kid? They haven't quite grown into their frame yet. Well, then you're gonna make that call to to have them adjust somehow so that they can do it properly. If they can't reach it and do the right things uh, right at the beginning, you need to keep note of that so that when they do, i.e., they can't reach this this pinky hook right here, 
because their hands are too tiny, but they can reach the thumb and the finger. So you may have to adjust and say, you can put yours on the top of this until you can reach it because you don't want them to have uncomfortable hand positions as they, as they get to learning their instrument. Uh, some horns I've seen come with some adjustable things. So if it's adjustable, make sure it's adjusted for that child. Anybody questions on that? Uh, yes. Sure. Um, on the leg versus off the leg. Um, so. I, for, for me, uh, this is my personal, my personal stance on this, uh, if a child's torso does not allow for them to put that on their leg, if I had a chair, I would show you, I do have a chair, I'll go around and look at So you'll know whether that child is able to do that on the leg or off the leg simply by looking at them sit in the seat, right? So if they're sitting in the seat and the natural position of the horn when they're sitting up tall and they bent in two places, it comes to their neck, then they're gonna have to raise the yeah. horn, period. There's no, there's no, it, cause the other option is this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what have we done? We've now crushed all the things that are gonna make us be able to play properly. We've crushed our lungs, we've crushed all those things. So if we're sitting up tall and the horn comes to my neck, then I'm going to tell little Johnny, Miss Susie, whoever you are, then you're going to have to grow a few muscles, young one, and you're going to have to lift that up to where it comes directly to you, right? Because you own the instrument, the instrument doesn't own you, and I say that to every, every kid. So you have the brain, the instrument does not. So if you're, going to go to the brain, if you're going to go to the instrument, you're saying the instrument is smarter than I am, right? So you want to bring that to you so that you are in the proper playing position. If that can't happen with them, with it, if it can't happen with it on the leg, then okay. But most times, it can't. Okay. Unless the child is extremely, extremely tiny. Uh, most times, I've seen where the kid is going to have to do a little okay. bit of work to keep that happening. Thank you. While you're in the seat, see. can you show us uh, the difference between how we see a lot of French horn players with the trumpet angle to it versus a French horn angle? Right. So. You want to keep everything in a this way, in a this way uh, motion, right? So if you're thinking about how a trumpet plays, the trumpet goes straight here. If you're thinking, you got your mind's eye trumpets here. Horn, you're gonna think a little bit more down. If you go straight across, then you're gonna have to bring that horn up to an end, or it's just not gonna, yeah. you don't want that. You don't want that. You wanna make sure that it's in a natural place, and if you do it correctly, when we talk about mouthpiece placement, you're gonna spray this off. Um, when we talk about mouthpiece pl placement, then you're gonna have a little bit of a downward slope to that horn so that it is correct, right? You're, they're gonna be able to, to play this and get the right sound. Now, if you go too far, up too far out as though you are a trumpet, the airflow will not, it won't flow direct, the direction won't be where it needs to be. That makes sense what I'm yes. saying? Yep. Yeah. Any questions on that? Thank you, Mr. Short. Can you spread that? Uh, trombone, a couple of things that, I, that I've noticed with the trombone. Um, by nature, I'm a trombone player, so it, it just pe it pet peeves me more than anything else to walk in and see, let me do it wrong for you, a couple of things. When we set the angle of the trombone slide too wide, okay, what it does is puts more weight, the heaviest part of the horn, in the wrong spot, right? So if I set this angle too wide, then when I go to put my trombone up to my face, the heaviest part of the horn is the weight is on the wrong part of my of my of my arm of my hand. Right? Um, See what I'm saying? Right? It's harder to maneuver. It's harder to hold. It's harder to get it. Get so what I like to tell them is to just make, make an L with it. There's no, I've never seen an L shaped like this. Um, so make an L and then tighten it down. Right? What this, this is going to do a couple things. A couple things. It's going to help them to be able to distribute the weight a little bit better. And then secondly, you're going to be able to notice quicker if they're holding it incorrectly. So here, is what I've seen in a lot of places. What's wrong with this? Anybody? This is now a bazooka. It is a, a weapon, a weapon of destruction. The trombone is a weapon of destruction already. We don't need to add any fuel to that fire. So we want the trombone naturally to be in this position. This position, danger, danger. This position, thank you. Okay, so if you get them to hold it properly, that's going to be the, the one of the one of the, the worst things I've seen is just walk in and the band sounds amazing. It's a good, good sounding middle school band, but I look at the trombone. Every trombone player is like this right here, right? 
So that, and that is, not, that, that is not a natural way to hold the trombone. My elbows had to come up a little bit higher than, than it needs to. So you want to make sure that it is in a natural state so that you have the nice triangle that most uh, brass players feel. Does that make sense? Okay. Slide holding, Hand, holding the slide. Um, I like to use the thumb and the, and the first two fingers, period. I don't, I, don't, I don't go too much farther than that with, with holding, my, holding my trombone. A lot of times you'll see them try to use the whole hand. Could it work? Yes. Is it going to get them the, the most flexibility with being able to move around the horn? Probably not. At some point, that's going to become a little bit labor. So what I do is I take my thumb and my first two fingers, tell them to make a crab claw, and then I stick my thumb on the top of the bar, then my two fingers underneath, and I like to put my third uh, and fourth fingers down here, my ring finger, my pinky, underneath that slide. Okay, that, and that's how I maneuver, like to maneuver the slide right there. There are many thoughts and processes and, and ways to do it, but that's just the way I do it. If you have a different way that you like that doesn't create tension in their, in their playing arm, then feel free to, to use that. Um, in their left hand, I like to always keep the secondary lock on my trombone slide. So my secondary lock, here's my first one. My secondary one is my pinky. Right? So I like to always keep on the secondary lock because inevitably you're going to have someone to forget to lock this one and lose control of that slide. So if they've got their secondary lock on, then they're not going to have any issue making sure that they don't lose their slide. Any questions on those holding things for trombone? Thank you. Good. All right. Uh, euphonium and tuba. Um, you just want to make sure, for me, I like to tell the euphonium uh, students to cradle. It's, it's more like a cradling of the instrument as opposed to a as opposed to a just sitting it on my leg and hoping that I can get in the right place. Once again, the instrument needs to come to you, not you to the instrument. So you want to make sure that whenever you're sitting up tall, you've got your good posture, that the instrument comes to you. So that means you're going to have to adjust. It's not every kid won't be the same. Every angle won't be the same. That's going to be a, a, a director thing where you just got to be able to say, okay, this is how you will hold it because of your torso and your, and your makeup, your physical makeup. Uh, tubas, if you can, if, if you can afford to in your district to have uh, three-quarter size tubas for your babies, please do so. Um, one, of the, one of the hardest things that I've, I've and this was not always the situation, we did not always have three-quarter size tubas in Gulfport, but trying to figure out how to get a, a little baby this tall on a tuba that was just as tall. So you have to kind of kind of maneuver that. If you're able to get the three-quarter size, great. If you're not, make sure you have the things necessary for them to be successful. A tuba chair, uh, not, not too expensive, but it will help them to be able to sit that tuba and have it in the correct place so that they feel like they're comfortable. I've seen people sitting children on books and then having a tuba in the chair and the kid falling off the chair. And the tuba. It's, Try to have the correct things for your students so that they are the most successful that they can be. So if all you have is full-size tubas and you have a tiny, tiny, make sure that you try to find a tuba chair for that, for that student so that he or she can, make, can play at the best of their ability. Any questions on those things before we hop into some buzzing and playing, I'm trying to get our first note? Good? All right, perfect. All right, so now one of the, the, the key fundamental things, a keystone habit, if you will, of brass playing is air, right? So, this is for you as a director, right? These are some things for you. You're not going to show them this. This is for you. You may have at some point figure out, hey, and now I can explain all this stuff. But the mouth shape is very important when you're taking in your first breath. You want to make sure it's in an O formation. We all know that. We talked about the how-to of breathing earlier. It's the same thing. We're making that O shape inside our mouth. Everybody do that with me. Ready? Sit up. Perfect. And we're going to breathe in the O. Ready? And let it out. Now, I want you to take your right hand and put it on your stomach, right? We're going to do the same thing. So if your stomach is going out towards me, you're doing the right thing. If your stomach and if your stomach does not go out and then your shoulders also go up, you've created tension somewhere in your body. One, two, ready, breathe. Do it again. So one of the, one of the coolest things about infants and babies is that they breathe properly. When you sit them on their back, their bellies rise and fall just like they should, just like they should when we take in our breath. But what we've learned over time is to not use our full lung capacity because we don't have to. So what you want to explain to your brass players is that breathing, uh, air that you use to stay alive is not the same air that you use to create a good brass sound it's, or any sound whatsoever in that, in that capacity. So yes, you br I'm breathing. I'm Miss Miss, I am breathing. No, yes, you are breathing, but now we have to breathe better. So they got to learn how to breathe in that O sound. Uh, the exhale 
exhalation is just as important as the inhalation. So when you're playing a brass instrument, there has to be direction to your air. There has to be intensity to your air. So this time when we breathe in, instead of us just pushing the air out, we're going to create resistance and give us a tss, Right? Everybody good? Is that? Hand on your stomach so you can feel that proper motion. One, two, ready, and breathe. In, two, here you go. Yeah. So when you get that concept moving with your kids, uh, we use the good sound meter, the, the breath meter, whatever you want to call it. You can use a piece of paper, a piece, whatever you want to use. Yes, you should have a cup probably on your stand, a piece of purple paper that's your good sound meter. Yep. So what we do with that first, before we even talk about mouthpieces, is that we take that piece of paper. You can see a child's airflow from just that. If that piece of paper is barely moving, then their air is not coming out with intentionality. If that piece of paper is flapping like nobody's business, then that kid becomes a demonstration kid and gets to show off for everybody so that everybody else can get that right. So if you find your piece of paper in your folder, then your sound o meter, can we have that one rolling and rocking? You'll see there's a target. There's a target, and you want to tell them to aim their air at that target, right? You're going to have it. Yeah, okay, so far. And so I want you to work a little bit. Don't get it too close because that's cheap. Okay? You're gonna work a little bit at that. And then we're gonna breathe in and then we're gonna push the air out and see if you can make your sound meter move. Ready? Set with your sound meters up. One, two, ready, and in and push. Did you have success moving your sound meter? Yes or no? And the answer is gonna be yes. I, I did it, right? You'll do this over, you'll have competitions. So I go around the room, I do groups, I do, because in my beginner man classroom, uh, I move to the fact where everybody is in their little circles in their little instrument groups around the room. So nobody really is in a band set because beginner band is not an ensemble class. Where I learn it. It's like little lessons going on here and there. And the easiest way for me to, to circulate the room and make sure I get everybody is to put them all, all the trumpets together, all the clarinets together, all the, all the, so I got little pods of people all over. And so we have little contests. Which group can make their sound meter move the fastest? Who can hold it the longest? All these things, ha excuse me, happening at the same time in the same classroom. I've never had the opportunity to teach uh, to homogeneous classes. Every last one of the beginner classes I've taught have always been everybody. So I've had flutes down there. So, every, so having them separated gives me the opportunity to walk around the room and create those habits that need to be created. So you want to learn to move the air. Once you learn to move the air, we've talked about the inhale, we've talked about the exhale, all those things, then you're going to be able to talk about the bud. So this is where the sound begins to happen. Uh, when talking about mouthpiece placement, let's get there. Let's talk about some of the some of the mouthpiece placement that we need to have. When you're explaining the buzz, the, remember that the air starts to buzz and the buzz doesn't start the air. So don't you think about that. The air starts the buzz. The buzz is a result of the air coming through the lips. So I want you to try this for me. I want you to push air through your lips and then get to the point to where there's nothing left to do but for your lips to come together and make vibrations. It looks like this. Right? So I, I was blowing air and I only brought my lips so far together and allowed the air to create that buzz for me. Try that on your own. Okay. So the, the goal for you is to be able to make that happen even, even faster than what you just did. So ready? Try that. Set. There you go. A lot of times this is what we get. We, we, do, we get this. As opposed to the opposite. If your air is not the, not the foundation of the buzz, your buzz is going to be extremely, extremely uh, anemic. It's not going to be very, very buzzy, very neat. So you want that air to start the buzz. Whatever mouthpiece you have brought with you today. So I'm, while you're grabbing that mouthpiece for me, I'm going to talk you through some things. Trumpets, I like to, like to go half and half. Now, when you're going half and half, you're going to go around each student. Technology is a thing. We, we just got to come to, to love it, learn to use it, and go with it. Every student just about nowadays has a cell phone. Cell phones have cameras on them, right? Uh, have them turn on their camera and have them make it face themselves. Make that, make, put it on their stand. And now they've got a mirror that comes with them every single day to school and goes home with them every single day. So there's a mirror, okay? So when you're talking about placing mouthpieces, now they can see it. So you've got your, your cameras on your face trumpets. We're gonna go half and half, top, little, top and bottom. So you're gonna get it right 
to, just about to the center of the face. That's just about where it should go. And as you're doing that, you're making sure that you feel teeth. Right? Because what we don't want to create is a trumpet player with an armature that does, or any brass player that does this. Yeah. Hmm? So you're feeling those teeth. Okay? Horn. Horn is a little different. Horn is going to be uh, two thirds on your upper, one third on your lower. Right? Go, just whatever mouthpiece you have, go with that. Two thirds on your upper, one third on your lower. Just sets you up for success. Now, if, you're, if you've got your, your camera on your phone looking at it, you can check that. And then as I'm teaching, I'm not standing in front of them. I'm walking in, around, and behind them, and I'm looking at their, I'm looking at their mirror and say, okay, you need to adjust that just a hair bit. You need to adjust, okay, can you come down a little bit? Great, perfect. And then I have them bring it down. I say, can you go to that place one more time? And see how fast they can get to it without having to adjust, right? So you're building muscle memory, not only uh, in how they bring things up, how they put things here, but how this goes to the face. It has to come to the same place every single time, okay? And then with trombone, I like to do the, the door method. So if you'll take your mouthpiece, whatever mouthpiece you have, and you'll put it underneath, put a little divot down there underneath your, underneath your lip, feel that divot? Mm -hmm. Close the door. It should be in the right place. Okay? There's, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult. Same thing work, will work with euphonium, right? And then tuba is going to be really, really kid specific. Uh, so when I'm talking about placement of the tuba mouthpiece, because we want to make sure that, that their mouthpiece fits on their face. So some faces are tiny and some faces are a little bit bigger. So you've got to literally go around and make sure that they get that tuba mouthpiece where it's going to be optimal for their buzz to happen. That will not be the same for every child. It, it will not. You can pretty much guarantee that a trumpet player, if, you, if they've been taught correctly from day one, it's going to be half and half. French horns are going to be two-thirds, one-third. Tuba, it becomes a little bit more where you have to go in and tell them, all right, this is where your mouthpiece needs to go. This is how you need to set that up every single time. Any questions on this so far? I know I'm trying to get fast. got a lot of instruments that I'm trying to get through uh, here. All right, good, moving along. All right. So we're, now we've established where our, our mouthpieces are going to go. We simply apply all the skills. It's a, this is a building process. So we talked about the air. We talked about the buzz and how the air starts the buzz and this creates. The next step is simply to have them do that on the horn. You're going to hear a couple of things. They're going to put the mouthpiece up and they're gonna, somebody's going to, this is going to happen. Have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. I've heard that a lot, right? There's a couple of things that they did not do. Can somebody tell me one? Tell me something. Yep. Air. There's no air behind the bus. There's no air. So all of a sudden, they get this mouthpiece, and everything they just learned two days ago just flew out of the windows because something new. You have to have drilled it to a point and practiced it and had them demonstrate to you and all these things to a point to where when they put this up here, it's a build on and not a subtraction. Is that clear? Am I making sense to you today? Good. All right. So then we're going to put our mouthpiece up, and then I'm going to say we have to breathe. We have to breathe. Remember us talking about breath. They're going to say, yeah, you got to breathe. So I'm going to have them breathe. Here's what a lot of kids will do. Uh, yeah. Will it work? Yeah, it'll work if they breathe through their nose. Will it work for the long haul? No. They're, they're not going to be able to get the volume of air in their body that they need. So it's our job to make sure we don't allow those little slips to happen. Because there's so many kids that are being in our room, we'll nine times out of ten not even notice that we've created a nose breathing. Right? We, we want to create mouth breathers. We're, we're going to all be, and I tell them that, we're all going to be mouth breathers. Oh, look, look. Yes, you do. You want to be a mouth breather in the brass room, in, a, in any room. Okay? So there's a couple of schools of thought to this. Corners, corner breathing. And then for me, I like to teach them to try to open up as wide as possible to get as much air as possible. So when I teach them to breathe, now if I go through my corners, I can achieve the same thing. It just takes me a little bit more, a little bit more discipline on my part. So all the kids in Gulfport have learned how to drop the jaw, and comes right. I tell them it's gonna come right back to the same place. It's just a magic thing that happens, and they they figured that out. So you want to allow them the optimal amount of space to get the air in the body. And once you do that, you get a buzz. Let's try it together, class. Set. Edge of your seat. Feet are flat on the floor. Come back on chairs. That is my mantra. I say it all the time, right? Me, then you. Uh, 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 uh,
teach them from day one is that the pitch, the buzz does not stay where it is. That, that first buzz that you get is not always going to be the same buzz. They've got to learn to manipulate the pitch early on, or when they start to play their instrument, they're going to get stuck and then, I can't play above a G. Okay, well, we'll work on that. But it happens a lot quicker if you will teach them now to start manipulating the pitch. And then what I'll do is I'll have different people lead that buzz every day. So once I've got a couple of few kids who can maneuver up and down their buzz and it sounds really clean, I don't become the buzz, I'm not the buzz leader anymore. That becomes a kid thing, that becomes a show off thing. And I say, okay, can you step up and lead the buzz? They'll lead that buzz, it'll be me then, they'll say, Hey, thank you, and then they'll go for it. It's the cutest thing. They think they're an amazing little little bandery little little teacher. Um, so, and it's, so it's important. Here's a, a, one thing about the knowledge that you're teaching them. It's one thing for you to show them. It's another thing for them to just mimic what you do. But when they can teach someone else, you know they have a grasp of the knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can have a little 12-year-old, 11-year-old standing up here and leading and then also giving correction because you've taught them to a point to know, uh, to say, your air wasn't fast enough. Or you've taught them to, your mouthpiece is in the wrong place. If they can now become you, then you've done your job. But if they only have two degrees of that process, if they can only uh, hear you say it and then mimic what you do, then they don't have a real grasp of that information. So make sure that you allow them to teach you or teach someone else or teach their circle of people. So what's happening uh, behind the scenes? What's happening while I'm going around to my little groups of, of people just uh, to hearing all the trumpets or hearing all the, uh, there's worksheets that, that we have that I stole from my friend, Zach Rose, gave me some uh, great worksheets where you, they have to name the part of the horn. I name a group leader. I have that group leader go through and literally all he or she is doing is they're in the center of that circle and they're saying, this is the mouthpiece and they have people point to the mouthpiece. This is the, and they're going through the names of the parts of their instruments all during these first couple of few days while I'm teaching them how to buzz in little circles. Every once in a while, I'll break out of a little small group and I say, everybody together, let's do it together and we'll whole group it. Then I'll say, go back to your names of your instruments. And they're working on names of instruments while well, now I'm over here working with the tubas. Whatever you do, have something for your kiddos to do if you're gonna spend that private lesson time. Every kid's gonna see my face, individually. Every small group is gonna see my face, individually. And then the whole group is gonna see my face a little bit. Right? Because it's not about the whole group right now. It's about teaching them these fundamentals. All right? So we've got some buzz things happening, and now we're trying to get to the first tone. So we're going to ask you to go ahead and put your equipment together. Put your mouthpiece in the horn. Right? It's going to make some sound. Make some sound. All right? Yes. Oh, yeah. I got you. Right? Oh. <laughs> Don't you worry, my friend. Don't you worry over here. Okay, so a couple of things that I want to go through with you about um, uh, the, you see all this right here, M brings the, brings the lips to the, to the teeth. That's what we're really striving for. We don't want to have any air pockets, right? So if you're M, then there's, you shouldn't be, you can't go, it's hard for me to go M and not make my, make my, make my teeth touch my, my lips, right? The inside of my lips. Or we create bad habits when we don't, when we don't enforce these things right here. Or two allows for the aperture to, to start to activate, right? So M here, and then we're gonna blow through that. This is, it's very, very brass is not hard, right? It's just very repetitive. You have to be very repetitive. You have to be a stickler on the fundamental things so that it happens great. All right. So we're making the first tone. Um, by the end of what, uh, however many, this usually takes uh, about four days or so for me to get through every single kid, and then every single kid is actually playing the right note for five days because some kids are a little bit harder to, harder than others. But you want to do a couple things. I'm going to refer to my notes here. You want to make sure that you demonstrate um, on each individual instrument. If you can't play a certain instrument, then make sure that you can play in the octave that you need to on your primary instrument so that they hear the correct sound. It's difficult if this is all, they, if a trumpet player hears this, what are they going to mimic? That. They're gonna, when they put that instrument to the face and you've said it a, a thousand times, this is open, you're going to blow right, and I want you to get this pitch. Then what's going to come out of their horn is a low C because that's the closest thing to their ear that matches what you're, what they're trying to uh, accomplish. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And just to piggyback on that, the biggest culprit of this are trumpet players who model trumpet and then don't understand why their tubas are playing too high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, cannot, you cannot have your tuba player sitting there listening to trumpet mouthpiece buzzing and expect that they're going to play F and low B flat. They're going to start screaming. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And, and so to that point, uh, thank you, Mr. Schwartz, to that point, uh, usually if you're in a team teaching situation, you want to have those tubas out of the room if you can. If you can't, if you can't, I get it. Then you need to tell them that you need to buy some, some earbuds or some, some something and plug your ears. I'll be with you in a couple of minutes, right? Time for tuba time, everybody else work. So whatever, however you can, can get them differentiated, please do. But if you don't have that option, figure out a way so that they don't always hear you playing your trumpet, your trombone, whatever the case may be. So try to demonstrate whatever pitch you want them to hear uh, throughout the class. If it's trumpet, try to demonstrate trumpet, try to demonstrate the trombone and so forth and so on. Uh, secondly, um, you're going to want to work in those one-on-one -on -one and small groups like we've, like we've been talking about. Uh, this is not the time for you to stand here on the podium and just give, you, give the one-two ready to go and, and see what happens over and over and over again until luck happens and you get everybody on the same note. Not what this is about. And then finally, you want to make sure that, that you're encouraging because one of the, one of the loudest and, and, and most raucous rooms at the beginning of band is going to be the brass room. There are all kinds of things happening. They're trying to figure out the face. They're trying to figure out all that. So you want to be encouraging to them. So we're going to get ready. We're going to get our, we all know how to hold the horn. We've gone through that. So that's all set. We're going to give the horns up. There's a process I go through to get them to this point, but no time. All right, I'm going to give you one, two, set. You're going to breathe in. Your armature is going to be set. And then you're going to play, all right? Me, then you. Everybody got it? Me, then you. One, two, me, then you. You're going to immediately say, good job, everybody. Now, everybody, some people, I need you to play the, I need you to play the wrong notes. I need you to play underneath the partial, whatever the case may be, so that we can address how you go through an uh, action. Right? Is that right? Me and you. <laughs> Not all of you, because then that'll take too long. So just, you know. All right, ready? One, two, me, then you. So just be mindful of that. The mouthpiece, the small piece, does require you to have a full instrument. Don't move to it too quick. Make sure that they have all the fundamentals of breathing and buzzing uh, before you move forward. Okay, move to the next one real quick. Uh, next one, did that already? All right, so these are the things. Full sound at all times. I don't want to teach them to, to try to play control right now. I want them to learn to move the air and push it. So full sound. <laughs> full sound at all times. You can worry about that other stuff in a, a little bit later. Mistakes are expected. In a band classroom, you have to learn that you're going to make a mistake, but you also have to learn that recovery is expected. So it's okay for you not to get it the first time, but I want you to try your absolute best to not let that one mistake cause you not to have success on the next go-round. And then always stress the proper fundamentals. Before I start everything, it's gonna, I say the same thing. Sitting straight up, both feet flat, all that stuff. Okay, what's on the edge of the chairs? It's just part of, it becomes part of what I do, okay? Um, something not to worry about right now. One thing I've, I've learned is that brass players will try to manipulate the pitch if they see it early on. If they're looking at the tonal energy, they're going to manipulate that pitch to match to make that smiley face green, and they're not going to learn to blow straight through the instrument in the right, the right way. So yes, tuners are good. I'm not saying that not to use them, but I'm saying when you're learning your first five notes, have them match you, have them match a, a harmony director or a drone or something like that, because you don't want to create somebody who doesn't have a, an embouchure set. 
They have to have something something set before they can start to maneuver any of the pitch. So yes, intonation is okay, listening and matching is okay, but for the first five notes or so, stay away from your tuner if you can. You can look at one, don't worry about them looking at one. The method book, it's there, great, it's gonna be there uh, for the whole year. You don't have to hop right into it. Uh, when my students hop into the method book, it's normally after they've learned probably the first two pages of material and didn't know that they've learned. So when they open that book, they're just reading it's like, man, I'm good. Yes, you are. You are. Wrong. Okay? Um, and everybody's not going to be 100% successful in every single class. That's, that's never going to happen. But what you're striving for is for them to, to have growth and for them to find a new definition of success. Because if they were better uh, on Tuesday than they were on Monday, then that's a good thing. If they're better this week than they were last week, then that's, that's a good thing. So help them to understand what success is and how to measure that. All right. Uh, fine. My final slide. Success is a small is a sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. So when you're teaching uh, any any class, a uh, woodwind class, beginner class, an uh, individual student, it's the small things that are repeated day in and day out that lead them to the larger things that you that you're trying to push them to. Yeah? Any questions? For woodwind players, clarinets and saxes, there's a huge difference in embouchure and development for brass players than there is for them. Why is playing loud so important? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, I've always just ha had them play loud because with a brass player, when they learn to use the air, the air is so important, and the manipulation of the air is so important. But playing with that good sound and that full sound first off helps to develop the fundamentals to be able to move to that next level, in my opinion. You are weight training for your lips. Yeah. Yep. The more air you use, the more weight you use, the stronger your lips get. That's the brass. Yep. Clarinets and saxes, you can take two weeks off, your sound doesn't change. Brass players, we take one day off at this phase, uh, we're starting over. And thank you for bringing up the harmony director or keyboard. Look, if you don't feel comfortable picking up every brass instrument and playing in their, in their range, find a keyboard. That's fine. It just has to be in the same octave. That's the main thing. Good. Any other brass questions? All right, let's say thank you, Ms. Pitts.